Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hanging with Dr. Cooper. I'm your host, Dr. William A. Cooper. This podcast is about living your best life now. We have four objectives, motivation, information, education, and transformation. We accomplish our goal through conversations with some of the world's top doctors, medical experts, thought leaders, and subject matter experts. We discuss everything from health, wellness, work, life, and everything in between. I am a husband, father, heart surgeon, author, entrepreneur, and veteran with over 30 years of experience in all aspects of healthcare delivery and 35 years of service in the United States Army Reserve. My personal story is that I'm one of eight children in my family. Five of my siblings and my mother are all deceased. Their lives are a microcosm of all that is out of balance in our healthcare system and society today. My work and passion is dedicated to their memory and the struggles they faced in their lives. Quite frankly, I do this for them to preserve life for you. On Hanging with Dr. Cooper, I sit down with fellow colleagues, friends, and professionals. We explore the hearts, minds, and souls of those who give back to the world through their life's work, passions, and achievements. We truly intend to give you the might. That's M-I-E-T, motivation, information, and education you need to transform and succeed in all aspects of your life. Please follow me on all social media platforms at Dr. Coop MD. We live stream from time to time on YouTube and Facebook. Please also subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Coop MD and share with your friends and networks. For access to all my content, programs, and products, sign up for my newsletter at www.drcoopmd.com. And I truly thank you for hanging with Dr. Cooper. Captain T, how are you doing today, my friend? You're doing wonderful. Doc, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. And we are uh, certainly glad that you are uh, joining us on uh, on the podcast, Hanging with Dr. Cooper. We certainly appreciate you being here. I appreciate the invitation and it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are uh, on Hanging with Dr. Cooper. I am your host, Dr. William Cooper. And here we have three objectives with one end goal, and that is to motivate uh, inform and inspire, uh, if you want to take the eyes together, as well as educate. But ultimately, what we want to do with this information is to help you transform, transform your life into the type of life that you want to live, the one where you are well, happy, and pursuing those goals uh, that you have set for yourself, your loved ones, and your family. And today, we're going to talk to, we're going to veer off of the health and wellness topic today and veer off into what I call my variety and certainly very inspiring uh, issues and talk to our Captain uh, T today about his new book. I encourage you to get that. It's called The Flight to Excellence, Soaring to New Heights in Business and in Life by Captain William T. Thompson. T, on this program, uh, you and I are great friends, go, go way back now, almost 15, 16 years, even before, well before Leadership Atlanta and the greatest class ever, 2006. But we go even beyond that. But I want you to just tell us, I have read your book. Tell us a little bit about you, Captain T. I know where you came from, but our audience may not. And we think that that is very important in terms of the listeners and the people who are going to be tuning into this later. Give them a little bit of motivation. Tell us where you're from, where you came from, and how you came to be where you are today. Well, Dr. Cooper, I'm from a small southern town, Orangeburg, South Carolina, a unique uh, southern town because it's got two HBC in it and uh, HBCUs in it. And so consequently, even though we were a small southern town, there was, uh, I'll use the term, black intelligentsia there in town because of the people that were associated with the college in one respect or Mm -hmm, another. mm -hmm. And so consequently, there's a, a, a lot of exposure to things that uh, would otherwise not be available to uh, a black kid growing up in a small Southern town. Mm-hmm. I uh, was one, one of the first black kids to go to what had been an all white high school back in the day. And uh, subsequently upon graduation became the first African-American from the state to go to the US Air Force Academy. Wow. And that literally changed my life, put me on a wow. track to uh, be exposed to things that I never would have even imagined as a kid growing up in Orangeburg. 
Wow. So tell me, there had to be some some really, you said the black intelligentsia in an academic town where you have teachers, and I'm sure you had all of the extensions of education, doctors and lawyers, and perhaps even back in those days, some entrepreneurs. So who were some of the people in the town there that sort of you looked up to beyond your family? I know you looked up to your mom and your dad and things like that, but you say, man, you know, that guy is really set an example in the community. Were there people like that in your community? There were a couple of black businessmen, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And there was one guy, Mr. Weber, uh, who owned uh, several businesses, real estate, including uh, a little car dealership, selling used cars, apartment buildings, and that sort of thing. In fact, uh, his, his wife, Dr. Clemmy Web, uh, Webster, lived until she was well into her 90s and was a, a very renowned educator uh, as well. In fact, she's got a, a daughter who's married to a guardsman wow. in Washington, D.C. Wow. And her oldest son was a guardsman. He and my mother were high school classmates, Dr. Wow. Paul Weber. Wow, interesting. Now, did, what about you know? You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to date you at all, but I'm going to say back in those days, I'm sure uh, there were still people around, like some Tuskegee Airmen and people like that that you heard about. So, but what inspired you to go into the Air Force Academy, the military? Take that route. Well, I was walking home from school one day, and I was feeling kind of down because it had been a particularly rough day at Orangeburg High. And I was walking along with my shoulders kind of slumped, my head hung down. And then all of a sudden, man, the ground started shaking. And I heard this loud roar as this sleek Air Force jet flew right over my head. Wow. I mean, it was so low, I could feel the heat from the jet engine. And I thought this thing was about to crash. Wow. And, uh, and at the last minute, the pilot pulled it straight up. He started rolling it around. And then, boom, I heard this this loud explosion and a plume of fire came out of the tail, as I now know that the pilot had kicked it in the afterburner and wow. it literally disappeared up into that clear blue sky. Wow. And so the, the seeds of my dream to fly a jet were planted that afternoon. Wow. Interesting. Very interesting. So you basically were, were on your way home. This is it. very interesting if you think about it. On your way home from school, down day at school, and all of a sudden, here comes this fighter jet flying over, pilot kicks it in the afterburner. You're amazed at this. And you go from being down to quite frankly, jumping on a pathway that is taking you quite literally way, way up. Yeah, it, it was amazing, man. You have to understand mm -hmm. that I had never flown on an airplane before. Wow. I'd never even seen one up close on the ground. Wow. So watching this whole phenomena take place before my very eyes was easily the most exciting and exhilarating thing that I'd ever seen. Would you call that an epiphany? An epiphany. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, when I talk, I talk to young people often times, and I can tell you that even in my profession and, and where I came from, I had those moments. I, I, you know, you just look back on it and you say, man, that was really very pivotal uh, for me. So you left uh, Orangeburg and went to the Air Force Academy. And I, I must tell you, audience, just so you understand who you're talking to, who I'm talking to here today, this is Captain T. Thompson. Captain T. Thompson is also as you know now, an author. And we're here today going to talk about his new book, The Flight to Excellence, Soaring to New Heights in Business and in Life. But he is also an attorney, uh, an entrepreneur, a certified, some speak, people say like me who think they can speak, but, but, but T is actually certified coach uh, as well as speaker. Did I miss anything, T? I mean, we got, you got I got pilot, uh, I've got, you know, you've done just about everything that everybody can imagine that, that one would want to do. Uh, did I miss anything? Just all around nice guy. Man. Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Now that is absolutely true. And I will also tell, I would also tell you as a young man relative to T, I will say T is never at a loss for giving you little tidbits about life anytime you come in contact. And that's the one thing I will say that, that I have taken from you. I like to give, but I've always taken, I just want to say that to you, that I take from you because every time I'm around you, you say something that is inspiring, uh, that's a perspective, or that gives me something that I, I need to think about and that also I can also take along with me. So tell us about the Air Force Academy. Well, well, first of all, it's very kind of you to say that, and thank you. I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, the Air Force Academy is one of the three uh, service academies that the nation has, military service academies. West Point, most people are familiar with, as well as Annapolis, and then there's the Air Force Academy, which I didn't even know existed when I was in high school because it wow. was 
uh, relatively uh, brand new at the time, the nation's newest service academy. But it, it's, um, it's a tough, demanding program. It's meant to be uh, in great part because one of the, uh, the most important things that I got out of that experience, apart from the education, which was a great education and, and the military training was the sense that you can do much more than you ever think you can do because that's one of the um, uh, uh, purposes of the schools, all three of them, to, to push you, to push you to the limit. Often you don't have the opportunity to stop or to quit. And they make you go further. And, and, and then once you've done it, you realize, wow, I've mm -hmm. done something that I never thought I could have done. And it gives you a whole different attitude with respect to facing life. Because you realize that you can do much more than you've ever considered that you might do. Now, so now, no, not everyone who goes to the Air Force Academy ends up being a pilot, although we're talking about the, quote, Air Force. You basically got there. You didn't really know much about it. And you had this epiphany of this, this, this situation or this, this experience that you had that took you uh, on, this, on this pathway. So when you got to the Air Force Academy, how hard was it for you to ascend to the level where they would even consider you uh, to go on to flight school and learn how to uh, be a fighter pilot and ultimately commercial pilot. Well, you're, you're ultimately true. Although I must say that the situation has changed uh, rather dramatically over the years. Now, the majority of the graduates still fly. But when I was there, 85% um, of my class went to pilot training. In, in the 7% in the, um, went to navigator training. So 92% of my class went to what's called a rated job. Mm -hmm. Now Nowadays, about 50% of the class goes right. to pilot training. And of course, now we've got space. In fact, we got a new space command. Right. So it's the Air Force Academy that services both the Air Force and space command. So we have a mm -hmm. lot of kids uh, that go in the different directions. Uh, and uh, the majority still fly, but uh, you have a lot of other opportunities these days. Excellent. So most people would say that uh, it takes about 10,000 hours to become expert or to become a master of any type of skill. But let's back up a little bit. I can remember very vividly the first day after all those hours of training I did as a heart surgeon and preparing myself for that very day that I would go out there and do that on my own. Tell me what it was like walking in or getting into that cockpit for the very first time on your own, a real cockpit now, not the simulator, not, you know, the buddy stick and all this thing, but by yourself, what was that, that experience like? If the boys back home could see me now. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you put that pedal to the metal, but then you weren't driving a car. So you, 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 right, you right. okay. Interesting. That, 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 that's it, man. In, in fact, um, that happened on my very first solo in a jet. A, a trainer type, but a fighter okay. type airplane. There was a okay. fighter version of it, but we didn't have uh, rockets on the wings. And I was sitting out there on the runway and I was thinking that very thing, man, if my buddy's back in Orange <laughs> <laughs> How about that? How about that? You took off and this, the rest is history, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But it, so, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's a very exciting career, very demanding career, uh, particularly in, in learning. Um, like some things in life, you know, once you've mastered it, um, the challenge is not always there. And, and our job in the cockpit is to be ready for the unexpected because right. uh, most of the time it's pretty, uh, pretty normal. But every once in a while, something out of the ordinary happens, and that's what you train for, and that's what you drill for constantly so that when that abnormal situation occurs, you can step up and do what you have to do. Got it. Got it. Now, so you were trained as a fighter pilot, and how long did you stay in the Air Force after the Air Force Academy? I, I did seven years of active duty. I did um, a year as a recruiter at the Academy. That was my first job as a second lieutenant. I played mm -hmm. football. And we had established a new minority affairs division. So I did recruiting for both uh, the athletic department and the minority affairs division, which was looking to increase the number of minority cadets at the academy. Did that for a year. Then I went to pilot training for a year. Mm -hmm. And the obligation after pilot training was five years. So I did mm -hmm. a total of seven years on active duty.
Got it. Excellent. And you retired from there. And then what, what from there on to directly on to commercial pilot or something else in between? No, I um, started going to law school at night when I was in the Air Force okay. on the GI Bill. I wanted to have something to fall back on if for yeah. medical reasons or economic reasons, I couldn't get an airline job. Uh, and so I got out after seven years. I got hired by Delta within uh, two months of separating from the Air Force and uh, went to training in Atlanta. I had a year left of law school to complete. And so I picked Boston as a pilot base because Delta had a base there, obviously. And I figured if I got to Boston, I'd find a law school where I could finish up. And okay. I was able to do that. Got it. Did you ever practice law or you just got the law degree? In no, I, I got the degree, passed the Massachusetts bar first time. How about Over that? percent of us did. Uh -huh. And in fact, interesting story, I actually passed the bar exam um, before I became um, a law school graduate. <laughs> wow. Wow. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I'd taken a semester off from, from school to go um, get trained with Delta. Mm -hmm. And and so after Delta's training and my positioning in Boston, it was January that I started my last year of law school. Mm -hmm. Finished uh, in December, a year from that. But there was no mid-year graduation in law school. I and see. So I was going to have to wait until June to actually graduate. But I had okay. six months downtime, so I petitioned the Massachusetts Bar to see if they would allow me to take the bar exam in February, even though I hadn't technically graduated from school yet. And after I explained the situation, they allowed me to do so. I took the bar exam in February. I got my results in May, and then I graduated from law school in June. Now, I would imagine if, if now I'm just thinking about this, I would imagine that coming in as a Delta pilot coming from the Air Force and having had that experience, versus someone who basically just came from the commercial or from the civilian ranks. What, how do you, how does that ranking system work? I know you ended up as a captain, which is like the top of the heap, but how does that work in terms of coming from the Air Force Academy? You didn't go straight to being a captain, obviously. What were the steps to get there and how long did that take you? Or maybe you did. No, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the airline business is strictly seniority and Everything, the routes you fly, the position you fly, the airplanes you fly, the vacations you get, it's all based on your date of hire. And so uh, now as it relates to someone not coming out of the service, your chances are better at getting hired by having the military background, either Air Force or Navy predominantly. Uh, and when I was there, about 85% of uh, the commercial pilots were ex-military pilots. But once everybody gets hired, whatever your source uh, of training is, you know, it's all date of hire. So it took me, uh, it took me about 11 years to become a captain. Now, part of that was choice because uh, I was practicing law for a while and then I got in op entrepreneurial ventures. And so my schedule was much more important to me at the time, being able to, uh, to control that than getting a higher position. So I could have been a captain earlier, but I would have been a junior captain and I would not have been able to control my schedule as much. I would have been on reserve, subject to being called out at any time. And so my seniority was important as a, as a co-pilot so that I can control my schedule to do the other things that I was doing at the time. Understood, understood. So now when you started out, so you were based out of Boston, were you just flying mostly regional or how do they do that? Do they start you regionally or you, you basically start going all across the country international? Yeah, no, all now across the country. You, okay. You, uh, you know, once you quote unquote take off and you're in the system, you, you could uh, end up pretty much any way domestically. Now I was a I domestic see. pilot at the time, so I wasn't flying international, which is a separate category. Got but it. I, particularly as a younger pilot, man, I, I saw pretty much every city Delta flew into. Wow. Uh, you know, the smallest cities, because when you begin, you're usually a, a co-pilot on a smaller airplane, like an MD-80 or maybe a 737. And those are the airplanes that are used in those smaller markets. And as you get seniority, uh, you can move up to a larger airplane, like a 767 or a 777. And those larger airplanes are used in the, the long haul markets, say New York, LA, and New York, Seattle, that sort of thing. Got it. And then once you finally have 
that seniority uh, as a co-pilot, you're pretty much close to becoming a captain. You have the seniority to become a captain. But once you become a captain, you go back to the small airplane again and work mm-hmm. your way up the other side. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. So see the small cities again as a captain. <laughs> I'll never forget, T, when we, you and I were in leadership in Atlanta, you, may, you probably don't remember this. You've got so many stories. But we were flying down to Orlando, if you recall, our class. I can't remember what exactly. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the weather, the weather was going to be a little bad today. And I looked over and said, T, man, I don't know about you, but I don't really like, you know, <laughs> like this kind of situation, man. That You know, we get guys up here on, on a... Uh, flying this plane and all this way. He said, well, what you ought to be worried about, Coop, is if he's not flying the plane. <laughs> said, gave me a totally different perspective. I said, but well, you know, you got a point. Now, he said, he, he said he's flying the plane, Coop. Don't worry about that. Right, right. Said, what you ought to be worried about if he's not flying the plane, then we got a problem. I said, you changed my perspective on that. Well, T, let's, let's switch gears uh, uh, just for a moment. We'll pause, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you are hanging with Dr. Cooper. I'm your host, Dr. William Cooper. Thank you for joining on my, on my show. Uh, this is a, a program and where we are here to motivate, inspire, to inform, educate, and ultimately help you transform your life and take the pathway that you have always dreamed of or perhaps sought a vision uh, to explore along this journey we call life. And I have my good friend here today, T. Thompson. We're going to transition now. T. is a man of many, many talents and has experienced a lot of things. He's a pilot, flew internationally. Uh, for Delta, as well as in the uh, United States Air Force, but he's also an author. And we are talking about his book today, which we're going to transition to now, The Flight to Excellence, Soaring to New Heights in Business and Life. You can get your copy on Amazon. You can also get it at the large book outlets like Barnes & Noble, which is where I bought uh, this copy, which is here with me at my home away from home in Kansas City, but I also have a copy of this uh, at my home in Atlanta. So T, tell us a little bit about your mo- motivation. This is not the first time you've written a book. You were actually a contributor on, on another book, if I'm not mistaken. I got a book at home that has uh, your name in it as well uh, from a few years back. But tell us kind of your, your writing and how you got into uh, this idea of literally purging thoughts, ideas, your skills and experiences onto print. Well, as you mentioned just a minute ago, I've had uh, an interesting life and I got some great stories. And over the course of the years, for one reason or another, I've uh, told a story, usually in the context of somebody talking about something that would relate to the story in one respect, or maybe a lesson that I learned from a particular uh, set of circumstances. And as I'm sure it happens with a lot of people, somebody said, man, you need to write a book. And, and I'd heard that so many times over the years, I thought, well, maybe one day when, when it's appropriate and I got the time, I'll consider that. And so that was part of it. The other thing is that I wanted to write not a book about me and my stories, but also a book to help people in their lives, in one respect or another, generally around entrepreneurship and wealth building. And I have used, uh, I call it the P4 system these days, but I've used a a continual process that has worked for me over the years, pretty much in everything I've chosen to do. And I wanted to share that process with my readers and frame it in the context of some of the stories uh, that I've lived in my life. And so I, I was able to pull both of those concepts together so that it is a book that will help you. And at the same time, you'll learn a little bit about me. So T, T, talk to, tell us a little bit about the P4 system. I mean, that is, that is in essence what this book is really drilling down. It's a fantastic book, by the way. I had to do a speed read this past weekend to get into it. But let's talk a little bit about to this system and, and, and why you think this is a, a really a good schema and a good framework for anyone, quite frankly, when they want to sort of put something around their vision and the ideas that they bring forth. Well, the concept of the book is based on excellence. And excellence is, is a very simple definition from my perspective. It is doing the very best that you can do. You see, I can't do the best that Dr. Cooper can do, but I can do the best that I can do. And so excellence becomes your personal choice. And the four Ps, and I call it the P4 system because each of the components begin, four components begins with the letter P. And I've often been accused not being very imaginative, but I'll take that. I'll accept that because quite frankly, there's something to be said about simplicity. That's exactly right. I agree with that. 
But the four P's are the first P is principles. You got to have the right principles or nothing else matters. And your principles have to be aligned. And we may be able to, to get into that a little later. Go right ahead. Uh, Help yourself. This, this is your hour, my friend. Go ahead. Talk about that. Yes, I want to talk about that. Yes. Well, OK, uh, let me go through the four P's and then sure. I'll come back to that. Absolutely. The second P is people. You want to surround yourself with good people and the right people. You know, if you're in a leadership position, you want to be good to the people you lead. Yes. The third P is a plan. Of course, I call it a flight plan. You know, before you take off, you got to know where you're going to land. And you got to be able to chart a course that gets you to that destination. And the fourth P is performance. You got to have a bias for action, a, a motivation to do. You got to be able to perform. Now, back to principles and what I mean by alignment, I'll give you an example. Principles is a word that's a homonym, which means that uh, it sounds the same, it's spelled the same, but can have different meanings. So for example, principles can be your personal conduct or your ethical standards, but principles are also fundamental laws of life. Like if I drop a pencil, it's gonna fall every time because of the principle of gravity, regardless okay. of what my personal principles are. And so you live a life of excellence, in my opinion, when your personal principles are in alignment with the fundamental principles of life in that particular area. So I'll give an example. Let's take money, because everybody talks about money. We all want to make money. We want to make more money, right? And, and, and there's certain fundamental principles of money. So for example, there is the power of compounded interest. There's the rule of 72, which is how fast your money will double at a given interest rate. And then there's a the fact that stock market has over its life increased on average between 10 and 11% a year. Now, if your personal principles are spending and consuming, then you're not gonna be in alignment with the fundamental principles of money. Sure. On the other hand, if you live a life of relative frugality, and I say relative because we all live at different levels, but relative frugality and you save and invest, then your personal principles are going to be in alignment with the fundamental principles of money. And there's a great example of a little Jewish lady who lived in New York City. Her name was uh, <clears throat> Ann, and, and Ann worked for the IRS. Uh, she worked her entire career, never made more than $4,000 a year. Uh, she worked hard, but didn't get promoted because uh, she was Jewish and she was a lady. But she learned about the principles of money by auditing rich people's tax returns. She also lived a very frugal life. She lived in a one bedroom apartment in New York City for ages. And I'm sure it was because of uh, rent control that she never moved. But when she died in 1995, this lady had a portfolio, never made more than $4,000, portfolio of $22 million, which would be worth $38 million today. Wow. 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 And so that's what I mean by alignment. And that applies in every aspect of life. We talked about money, but it also applies in relationships. It applies in health and wellness. You know that. Car yeah, sure. A heart surgeon. You know, they're fundamental principles of... Uh, of how you live a healthy life, right? Absolutely. And if Absolutely. your personal principles are in alignment with those fundamental principles, then in most cases, you're going to live a pretty good life, pretty healthy life, and you'll, in, in most cases, uh, live a long life. Excellent. So that's, that's what I mean by alignment in terms of principles. Excellent. Uh, T, talk to me a little bit about, let's just go through this. Let's talk, talk a little bit about people. I, one of your, your, certainly your competitor airline, and I, people ask me all the time, I had the opportunity early in my career to start a heart surgery program at uh, Wellstar Kennestone Hospital back in the early 2000s. There was no book I could go buy that says, this is how you do it, okay? Right. I had to sort of think about, how do you go about doing this? What's important? And one of the things, and one of the books that I read uh, was by a, a PhD, an academic uh, at Brandeis at the time. And I think she was actually working, this was part of her PhD thesis, if I'm not mistaken. And her name was Jody Hoffer Gattel. And she wrote a book that really impressed me. And it impressed me for one reason. And that is because it really, really drilled way down on the principle or the, the concept of people and human capital and how you identify, how you engage, how you reward, how do you incentivize, uh, how you part ways sometimes with them. 
And the, the title of that book was, at that time in the early 2000s, The Southwest Airlines Way. And I say that was one of your competitors. And they did very well, as you know. Because and it's still of some a great of, company. Yeah, great, great company. company. Absolutely. Southwest. Yeah, because of some of the, the, the prospecting and things that they did and the decisions they made from a business perspective that other thoughts would thought were a little uh, out of line with what the typical industry would do. But this book was very important because they talked about something in a concept she talked about in that book called Relational Coordination. And the idea of what I took away from that was really how do you coordinate relationships or you put people in the right situation, in this case, in the airline, whether it was a pilot or whether it was one of the grounds crew or whether it was a flight attendant or whomever, but how do you get all of these people with all of these different relationships with the company to then coordinate their relationship with each other that that would then feed into the ultimate value creation mm -hmm. for Southwest. It was an amazing principle. And I really, I took that back to work when I say I read this book because there was no there was no plan for heart surgery. How do you start a program and what do you do? Right. And it really impressed upon me the importance of people and engaging with people and keeping people as a top priority when you are leading them and making sure that they understand where your grounding, is, where your principles and values are really grounded. So talk to me a little bit, you talk about this in your book. So put that in context of this P4 process that you you have put forth in the flight to excellence. Yeah, okay, so I, I, I'm gonna give an example and it relates to the airline industry and it's more specifically about my interview with Delta. So I'm sitting in the, uh, in the office of the director of pilot hiring and he had a reputation that preceded our interview that he had interviewed. Uh, he'd been with Delta 30 years. He'd interviewed thousands of pilots uh, and he'd rejected thousands of pilots from Delta. And so I'm sitting there and I'm a little nervous because I'm aware of his, his, uh, his reputation. Yes. But we're having a great conversation. You know, he's telling me about uh, his background growing up in a small Tennessee town. He had been to Orangeburg before. So we talked, he asked me the question, what was it like as a black kid growing up in Orangeburg? You know, asked me about my family, those sorts of things. Uh, easy going conversation. I'm thinking, okay, this is the prelude to the formal interview, right? Uh, and, and, but after a while, he, uh, he kept on going. I mean, we're just having a conversation. I finally asked him, I said, uh, do you want to, Talk about my Air Force career. You want to see my flight logs and everything? <laughs> You're like, when, when is the interview, interview going to start? <laughs> yeah, yeah, when's, exactly. When's the interview going to start? I got to get out of here. <laughs> he leaned over Coop and he looked me dead in the eyes and he said, he said, T, we know you can fly a jet. He says, you wouldn't be here if you couldn't. Then he said, I just want to find out what kind of person you are. Ah, uh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me a question. Mm. He said, tell me, are you a very religious guy? That threw me off guard. In fact, nowadays it's against the law. Yeah, that's, that right. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, Jesus Christ, I'm not expecting this. And I'd grown up going to Catholic school and, uh, you know, uh, was an altar boy for a while. But as time went on, my devotion had kind of slacked off a little bit. Uh, mm. Went to mass on occasion. Mm -hmm. But uh, I couldn't say I was a very religious guy, but I was in law school. So I thought, well, let me act like a lawyer, you know, be evasive. Okay. And I said, yeah, I do believe in God. He said, okay, but well, that's good. He said, but, but do you go to church every Sunday? Hmm. There it was, man. Ethical dilemma, staring me straight in the yeah. face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I could have lied. He wouldn't have known whether mm -hmm. I go to church every Sunday or not. There you go. And, uh, and, and and here's what I knew. I'm down in the South. A lot of people go to church every Sunday in the That's South. That's right. This yeah, guy Bible from Tennessee, an older white guy, uh, obviously religious because he's asking me these, these religious questions, right? Uh, and I thought, I said, man, you know, and, and this is Delta. This is my future aviation career. So, so the temptation to lie was extremely strong. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I went to school, the Air Force Academy. We got an honor code. Uh, the first core principle in, in the Air Force is integrity first. That's right. That's right. And so, uh, so I said, well, no. I said, no, I, I can't tell you that I go to church every Sunday. And I immediately felt uh, down and disheartened because I figured the next thing he was going to say was, thanks for coming down 
Uh, glad you can make the interview, but you just not dealt the material. And then he began to speak. And he said, T, uh, I'm glad that uh, you came down. He said, I'm glad you don't have to go to church every Sunday. He says, because we're an airline. We fly 365. Our pilots have to go to church. what he said. Uh, and I would never hire somebody uh -huh. and potentially interfere with their strong religious beliefs. Wow. It's absolutely so He would set, uh -huh. set me up to see if I would lie because uh -huh. he walked me down that path, you know? But you know, that's a very interesting, that's a very, that, that story is so powerful because the, in, embedded in that story is a couple of things. One is, you know, we, we've heard over and over again, the truth shall set you free. And in this case, it did. Mm -hmm. But you you had a choice. You had right. a choice to make because inside you want this job and you had a preconceived notion of what you thought he was, if you think about that. And, yes. and, and, and it was absolutely the opposite of what you thought. And that's right. important. I think that's an important point for people to really understand because if you stick to the principles, as you talked about, and, and one of your principles should be the top of that list ought to be integrity, okay? Yes. If you stick to that, it's going to always serve you well. And you and I, and I want to bring this story up to you. You remember, this is another story that had a really, really, uh, not, not a profound, but it, it had, I, I had this situation never happened to me where I was in the head to contemplate that. But the story always stuck with me. If you remember when we were in Leadership Atlanta, Michael Thurman came and spoke to us. And he told you about, and I think it was during our race, uh, segment. And he talked to us a little bit about it. It may have been about something else, community relations or something. Yeah, he was the closing speaker for a weekend. Right. And he came in and that you remember the story he told about the first time he ran for office and he went to, and he was canvassing going door to door. And he told the story of going to this, knocked on this door and said, Oh boy. Uh, and, and, and an older white woman opened the door and he handed her the flyer, said who he was and, had all of his accolades and all of his things on there. And he was running for office and gave the lady the sheet of paper that had all of this stuff, his bio and everything on there. And she looked down at the paper and, and then looked up at him and said, oh, you one of them. And in his head, he was thinking, oh boy, here we go with the black thing. You right, know what I mean? right. And in fact, he was like, well, ma'am, I don't really, what, you know, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. And she said, you one of those lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was, again, one of those situations yeah. where you, you have this perception of something and it turns out that it's not. And I think that really relates to your principle of people, to be honest with you, because uh, obviously that's where you were telling this story. Um, but oftentimes, if we give people a chance, they, you know, Maya Angelou said it. Believe them when they tell you who they are the first time. Right. Oftentimes, but oftentimes, but oftentimes, you have to break down this, this barrier of what you think someone is to get to who that person really and truly is. And I think that's that that's what I learned from your book. And I learned, I learned that I've had these experiences throughout my life and, and, and really understanding the value of putting the right people around you. And sometimes that means you got to let some of the wrong folks go too. Uh, and, 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 and do that. So T in the time that we have remaining, let's talk about the last two principles. Uh, the, the next one is a plan. Talk about plan, the flight plan. Flight plan. And I'll, and I'll put it in context for you. I've flown 18,772 professional hours as a pilot. And that, uh, that equates to 112 weeks, 26 months of living up in the air. In Coop, I have never, ever, not even once, taken off without knowing exactly where I plan to land. And, and that concept applies to life as well. I've always set the goal first and then figured out what I needed to do to get there, but I knew where I was trying to get to. Mm -hmm. and, um, and most people don't do that. Because most people don't take the time to sit down and think. See, thinking is, is tough. I, I use the analogy, if you've ever painted a room before, of having to, quote, unquote, cut the room first. And what that means is you got to paint around the window, 
you got to paint around the baseboard. You got to paint where the ceiling uh, meets the wall if it's a different color. And that all takes uh, a lot of time and effort because you have to be very particular about what you're doing. But you're not really getting a whole lot done in terms of physical paint on the wall. But once you've done all that, now you can take the roller and you can go to town and you get the rest of the room painted in like no time. Right. Although right. this is where most of the actual paint gets put on the wall, right? Right. And, and that's what thinking is to doing. Most people want to do, but they don't want to take the time to think because thinking is difficult to sit down and, and work through that process. But that's where all the, the effort is. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's where you, you, you get it ready to go. And you may not actually get a lot accomplished in terms of the physical uh, amount that it takes, but that's after you've done that, you, you can jump on with the roller and, and get it all done. And that process has worked for me time and time again. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So in, in, this, uh, in this planning process, T, do you espouse sort of taking it in segments, taking, you know, people say you can't eat the elephant in one bite, you can eat them one bite at a time. Talk a little bit about going through that planning process. You got to think about it, obviously. But then how do you sort of get yourself through that process to say, okay, this is what I'm going to stick with here right now. This is what I got to do. And to keep yourself on that pathway, regardless of what else externalities may occur. Well, you know that story at the beginning of our interview when I talked about walking home that day and seeing that jet? Yes. And I said that the seed of my dream to fly a jet was planted that very day. Mm -hmm. But I'm a young black kid in the segregated South, man. I'm a million miles away from flying a jet, a million miles away from becoming the first African-American to go to the Air Force Academy, a million miles away from sitting in the cockpit of a jumbo jet or flying faster than the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I started going to the school library doing study hall rather than going there and putting my head down on the desk and taking a nap. Mm, I started okay. reading, reading magazines and I read a couple of books on aviation. And, I, and I'm thinking, what does it take to become a pilot like that guy that I just saw? It took me two days to realize that somebody was actually in that airplane. I was so focused on the airplane. Yeah. I forgot about the fact that there's somebody in there somebody making in do the these things, right? <laughs> That's right. And I thought, how in the world does somebody get to do something like that? Right. So I started reading educating myself on how do you become an Air Force pilot? And there were different ways. You know, you could go to college and join ROTC, or you could go to uh, officer training school after college. And then there was this, this line that says, are oh, there are these academies, Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, but they are resigned for the select few. Mm -hmm. I thought, why are they reserved for the select few? What makes them so special? So I, start digging in the academies. And I found out that you had to have a, a congressional or a senatorial or, or a vice presidential nomination to even compete to get into one of those schools, mm -hmm. you see? And so it became an iterative process. The more I learned, the deeper I had to dig to find out what was going on, mm -hmm. the more I educated myself. And then I thought, well, heck, I can, I can do that. Because yes. there was, I came across them uh, a catalog for the Air Force Academy. And as I flipped through there, they laid it all out. How you get in, how you write your congressman, what the address were in DC and, and what the letter had to say. Right. I thought, well, I can do that. Maybe probably turn me down because Strong Thurman was my senator and my congressman was a strict segregationist. Uh, but I go for it. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I came across uh, a Coast Guard Academy catalog. Now, the Coast Guard Academy is not a military service academy. Right. It's under the Department of now Homeland Security. Security, Security. Security. Back in right. the day, it used to be Department of Transportation. Right. Um, I didn't even know the Coast Guard had an academy, but pretty much set up the same way. There is also a Merchant Marine Academy. So there are actually five mm -hmm. service academies, the three military academies, and they're called military because they're under DOD. Right. And then these other two uh, service academies. And then and I discovered that the Coast Guard Academy didn't require a congressional nomination. It was strictly on competition. 
And so that became my focus because I figured I'd have a much better shot there. I wouldn't have to go through the politics. But lo and behold, I got a sixth alternate nomination from my segregationist congressman. I'm sure wow. he never felt that I would get in being so far down the list. Wow. Uh, so it, it, when it ended up, I ended up with appointments to two different service academies. I, I made it to the Coast Guard and I got the Air Force Academy as well. But that was the process of planning, just going and educating myself. There was no no uh, internet back in those no days. No internet, that's right. Just sitting out of desks and, and, and pulling magazines off the shelf and going through the card catalog thing and finding books on aviation to educate myself because I knew this guy was doing it. There had to have been a process for him to get in that cockpit. And if he could do it, I figured, hell, I can too. Yes. So that was the process. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And I don't know if you know this, if, you're, if you didn't know that yours truly was a class of 1990 West Point. All right. Uh, yeah, United States Military West Point. I just I chose not to go, but I was selected All right. by then Senator Thomas F. Eagleton. Uh, from mm -hmm. the state of Missouri. So I know what that process is like. There was no internet even then in the early, I, I mean, that was 1984, three or four, where I was looking to do this. Right, and right. and, and uh, yeah, so I remember going, having to go to, the, man, I went to the library. I was writing letters. You know, back in those days, you had to write letters and ask right. for information, <laughs> it, getting on the microfish and things like that. Well, good, T. So we're talking, this is Hanging with Dr. Cooper in our final segment here with uh, uh, Captain T. Thompson, uh, the author of flight to excellence, soaring to new heights in your life, your business, or whatever endeavor you choose to uh, pursue. And T is talking to us about his P4 system, with he, which he outlines very, very well in his book. And the final uh, principle is performance. We have to perform. So tell us a little bit about performance, T, and, and your thoughts uh, on that as it relates to your book. Well, uh, again, that's that, that motivation to do that buys for action. I was a young co-pilot with Delta uh, and I was flying what was called a Tampa turnaround out of Atlanta down to Tampa and back. Had an hour to kill, so I figured I'd get off the airplane and stretch my legs. I was going up an escalator. I saw this African-American gentleman coming down, uh, looking at me intently. So I gave him a polite nod. Uh, when he got to the bottom, he hopped on the upside and he chased me down. He said, excuse me, sir. He said, are you an African-American? I said, absolutely, true and through. He said, well, I thought so, but you might've been Hispanic, so I didn't want to assume. <laughs> he said, my name is Jeff, and I just want to shake your hand because I've never met an African-American airline pilot before. He said, it was a dream that I once had. Wow. Now I'm too old and I don't have enough flying time. He said, but I work here at the airport in operations, so I'm still close to the game. How about that? So I asked him, I said, well, how old are you and how much flying time do you have? He said, I got about 230 hours um, and I'm 34 years old. Now in my Delta class, we were all 28 and 29. We averaged about 2,200 hours. So yeah, this guy was too old and had a fraction of the flying time he needed, but he knew that, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, rather than pile on with something negative, let me give him a little hope. I said, you know, Jeff, every airline pilot I know had 230 hours at one time. I said, that's just a number on your way to building more time. Right. I said, yeah, 34 is a little old today, but who knows what the pilot model will be in five or 10 years, you know? I said, I keep flying, put myself in a position in case something changes down the line. Years and years later, I'm now a captain. I'm in the Cincinnati airport. This guy walks up to me, he says, Captain Thompson? I said, yeah, he's a pilot. He said, uh, I just want to reintroduce myself to you because we've met once before. Wow. He said it was 13 years ago in the Tampa airport when I first saw you on the escalator. And I remembered immediately. Yeah, just like that. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my God, you're a pilot. <laughs> he said, Airline pilot. He said, yeah. He said, he said, I'm a captain on a regional jet. And he went on to tell me his story. Wow. And he said, I've been looking for you in airports for years. He said, I reached out to Delta, but because of privacy, they wouldn't right. give you your information. He said, but I, I, I've always wanted to thank you in person because you were the only one in my life at the time who didn't tell me I was too old or that I didn't have enough flying time to become an airline pilot. Wow. And because of you, I'm living my dream every day. Wow. Now that day for me in Tampa was just a polite conversation. 
him, it gave him the motivation to act on what he really to do, to try to chase his dream. And because he acted, he was motivated to, to do, because he performed, he was, in his words, living his dream every day of his life. Wow. And on that note, I don't, I can't think of a better story to that aligns with what we're about on this show, hanging with Dr. Cooper. Captain T, it's been an absolute pleasure having you as my guest today. We're going to have this uh, available for our audience here in the next uh, few days or so. And we really appreciate you uh, for being here with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, <clears throat> my friend uh, and the author of The Flight to Excellence, uh, Captain T. Thompson, and we thank you for uh, spending some time with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, remember that we are here to motivate, inform, inspire, educate, and help you to transform. Live your life, live it, live it well, live it now. Remember, today is the best day of your life. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is not promised. We'll see you next time on Hanging with Dr. Cooper. Take care. Thank you, Dr. T. Or Captain T. I keep on saying doctor. Captain T. That's thank you. All right. You know what? I, I, P, uh, JD. So I got a Jewish doctor. <laughs> That's right. A Jewish doctor. That's right. I love it, man. Hey, yeah, take care, I've, T. I've enjoyed it, man. Thank you very much. This has been a pleasure for me as well. Thank Absolutely. You. Take care. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. You've been listening to an episode of Hanging with Dr. Cooper. I'm your host, Dr. William A. Cooper. Remember, Today is the best day of your life. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not promised. Live it. Love it. Be well. And thank you so much for hanging with Dr. Cooper. We'll see you next time.